Perfect. Okay. So give me one more second. I'm just going to go live on Facebook. <clears throat> All right. Perfect. So, okay. Without further ado, oh, there's some more people. Gone wrong here. <laughs> okay, perfect. So, so welcome everyone. My name is Nicole. Um, and I just want to introduce um, Kevin. Um, but before I do that, I just want to acknowledge that um, the Wild Bird Trust is located on the unceded, the ancestral and the traditional territories of the Coast Salish people, that being the tsleil the Squamish, and the Musqueam First Nations. And here at the Wild Bird Trust, we are uh, dedicated to um, creating strong and meaningful relationships with our host nations, as well as working towards uh, reconciliation and redress. Um, so thank you to the host nations for allowing us to, uh, to partake uh, in these amazing events on their land. Um, okay, so a few people have joined us. Hi there. I'm just going to introduce Kevin and then Kevin, I'll let you take it away. So okay. um, Kevin is uh, an amazing um, birder. Um, he's a lifelong naturalist, ornithologist, ecologist, and retired chief naturalist slash manager at the Lynn Canyon Ecology Center and the DNV Natural Parklands. And Kevin Bell was also one of the founding members of uh, the Wild Bird Trust um, and actually helped, you know, just start this organization. So um, I have learned so much. I say this every time, Kevin, but I do mean it. <laughs> I've learned so much from Kevin um, over the past few months. My bird knowledge has just expanded so much. And I love that you, Kevin, are able to share all of your knowledge and wisdom with us. So I really appreciate that. Um, I am going to be sharing a story at some point today during this event. So you just let me know, Kevin. I'll keep my ears uh, peeled for that. Um, without further fun. ado, ado, I will let you take the stage. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Nicole. That's really great. And uh, and Nicole's story will be coming up very soon because it's going to be about the raven. And we are starting today with the raven because that is the largest member of the crow family. And indeed, uh, at, uh, I believe it's uh, two and a half pounds average weight, the raven is the largest songbird that we have. It uh, It is actually a Crows are members of the songbird group. And indeed, <laughs> they don't have terribly beautiful noises. Uh, they have a lot of noises. And the raven here is the biggest one. And on the left is a painting by a Canadian artist called J. Fenwick Lansdowne. He, uh, he spent his life in a wheelchair. I believe it was polio. And he lived in uh, in Hong Kong and then in Victoria during and after, I think just after the Second World War. But he was a leading Canadian artist. And here we have the raven, the massive beak, uh, the feathered beard, and of course the wedged tail. And if you look at the claws, you can see Indeed, they have a certain reptilian uh, look. And of course, all birds are descended from the dinosaurs. So they are, in fact, dinosaurs. <laughs> this bird, uh, you can see its eye looking at you there that uh, Lansdowne has painted. On the right is a raven flying and being attacked by a crow. And you can see the size difference. Crows are just about half the size of a raven. And these crows do not like ravens, principally because ravens eat their eggs and young and also compete with them for food. A raven, and here we have a pair painted by a man called Archibald Thorburn, who was painting in Lake Victorian and uh, right up until uh, just after the Second World War. He was one of the leading ornithological artists. 
and Thorburn has painted this pair of ravens in their mountain home. And you can see they are quite uh, fearsome looking birds. Uh, they, uh, they have a beard, both male and female. They're the same size and they're tough and highly intelligent. People have taught ravens how to speak. Now ravens have a very macabre history with the human species. And here we have four pictures of Homo sapiens going to war. Uh, the top right, we have native North Americans going to war on horses in the plains of North America. Beneath them, we have the, uh, the wars of the Crusades in the Middle East. Top left, we have the Pictish clans attacking Hadrian's Wall at the time of the Romans. And beneath that, we have the sack of Rome by the, the Goths. Now, all of these wars had armies marching, and ravens followed the marching armies. Whenever ravens saw a bunch of human beings, marching, they followed them because the ravens knew that dinner was going to be served. And ravens, like other scavengers, and there were plenty of them from coyotes and wolves, bears, and of course, avian scavengers like the red kite in the top right, magpies in the top left, bald eagles on the bottom left, crows, golden eagles, and of course, magpies and hooded crows, all of these scavengers had no, they didn't discriminate about what they ate. And when it came to human beings, they showed absolutely no discrimination at all. They'd eat everybody. So here they are, scavengers, highly intelligent, some of them, especially the members of the crow family. Uh, for example, uh, when I worked for the District of North Vancouver Parks Department, uh, I got a phone call from these gentlemen, these uh, hand gliders and gliders that off Grouse Mountain, and they like to land on a playing field uh, about halfway up Capilano Road. And they wanted a couple of trees top so that they could glide in there and make an easier landing. So. We accommodated that. They were hemlocks, and uh, it was fine. But I got to talking to the hand gliders, and I said, how do you know when you jump off at the top of Grass Mountain, how do you know where you're going to find an updraft, a thermal of rising hot air? And they said, well, what we do generally is we look for soaring birds. And we generally look for gulls, uh, hawks, so like Cooper's hawk in the bottom here, the middle bottom, or a harrier on the left, turkey vulture on the top right, a red-tailed hawk in the middle, top middle, bald eagles, or ravens. But he said, I am never going to trust ravens again. And I asked him why, and he said, well, I jumped off some months ago, and there were a couple of ravens soaring in what looked like a good hot air thermal rising. And they were doing a good job of soaring in it. So I went over there, and there was no thermal. I was going down. And as I went down, those ravens flew around me, laughing at me. They were making cawing sounds, and either they were just having a laugh and saying, what a good joke we fooled you, or they were saying, your dinner. So there you are. So I think we're going to get a story from our co-host here, hopefully. Yeah, yeah I would love to share. 
So, yeah. So I just want to introduce myself. Um, uh, so like I said, my name's Nicole. Um, and on my dad's side, I am uh, Stalo from Lacomel First Nation or Lacomel First Nation, um, as well as having um, ancestry in Squamish Nation as well. Um, and then on my mom's side, I am third generation Canadian settler. Um, and so I, I do like to introduce myself before I tell a story, um, just because that's um, protocol that was shared with me. Um, I am going to be sharing one of the more uh, well-known stories about Raven, um, but I do urge all of you to go um, when you're finished and see if there's any um, folklore or stories about Raven um, where you're from. Um, and like we know, um, sorry, my neighbor's yelling, <laughs> uh, like we know um, Raven is found across you know, like all over the globe. So there's many stories um, from many different nations and people. Um, yeah, and so this one is going to be um, a Haida story, um, but this story is adapted and used by many different nations, um, especially in the north of British Columbia. So I hope you enjoy. Um, and yeah, I will begin. Okay, Oops, sorry, my computer's falling. <laughs> um, okay, so um, this story uh, is called Raven Steals the Sun. So in the beginning of the world, it was total darkness. The raven who had existed from the beginning of time was tired of groping about and bumping into things in the dark. Eventually, the raven came upon the home of an old man who lived alone with his daughter. Through his slyness, the raven learned that the old man had a great treasure. This was all the light in the universe, contained in a tiny box, concealed within many, many boxes. At once, the raven vowed to steal the light. He thought and thought, and finally came up with a plan. He waited until the old man's daughter came to the river to gather water. Then the raven changed himself into a single hemlock needle and dropped himself into the river. Now, for any of you who don't know what a hemlock tree is, it's like a pine tree, right? Like almost like a needle bearing tree. Um, but the needles are very soft, like very, very soft. So you wouldn't feel it, you know, in your throat. You might feel a pine needle, but you wouldn't feel a hemlock needle. So just to let everyone know that. Um, and he dropped himself into the river, just as the girl was dipping her water basket into the river. So right when she was dipping it, this hemlock needle went into the basket. And for any of you who might be wondering, many of our cedar baskets here on the West Coast are, um, can be watertight, so they can actually hold water. As she drank from the basket, she swallowed the needle. It slipped and slithered down into her warm belly, where the raven transformed himself again, this time into a tiny human. After sleeping and growing there for a very long time, at last, the raven emerged into the world once more, this time as a human infant. Even though he had a rather strange appearance, the raven's grandfather loved him. But the old man threatened dire punishment if anyone ever touched the precious treasure box. Nonetheless, the raven child began and begged and begged to be allowed to hold the light for just one moment. In time, the old man yielded and lifted the box from a warm and glowing sphere, which he threw to his grandson. As the light was moving towards him, the human child transformed into a gigantic black shadowy bird form, wings spread ready for flight and beak open in anticipation. As the beautiful ball of light reached him, the raven captured it in his beak. Moving his powerful wings, he burst through the smoke hole of the roof and escaped into the darkness with his stolen treasure. But as he flew higher and higher, the light became heavier and heavier. And eventually, Raven was too tired to continue carrying the light. And so he opened his beak for one small second, and the light slipped from his beak. And that is where the sun stayed in the sky. And so the, the light was the, the sun, basically. Um, and so that's where the sun 
left and and that's how raven stole the sun now this is a Haida story there's many stories there's some from clinkett territory there's an amazing one from okanagan nation so again i definitely suggest wherever you're from to go and look up um what story is from your nation um and or from wherever you live so yeah so thank you so much kevin i hope that was was okay oh, that was excellent great thank you all yeah. right I'll go on that you know, and, and, and the raven, the, he, he, he liked the bright, shiny object. Yes, exactly. Yeah. And wow. the, the ravens are known all across the world as being tricksters. So oh, yes. um, in that, you know, in that same story role in several different nations, which I, I just love. It's so funny. <laughs> they, they really, you know, ravens are actually very smart. They're so smart. They're, 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 they're really very are. smart. They're, yeah. they're, I mean, they're the only bird. Uh, one of the only bird species that survives in the Arctic through the winter. Now, you know how cold it gets up in the Northwest Territories, the Yukon, back up, up in that part of the world in the winter. Alaska. In parts of Scandinavia too, right? And, yeah. And yeah. they survive there all through the dark winter. So they're, they've hidden food. What they do is they hide food and that's what keeps them going in the winter. They're, pretty They're smart. smart little guys, I swear. Yeah. <laughs> Anyways, I'll, I'll let you continue on, but thank you everyone for listening. <laughs> okay, well, thank you. That was great. So the other bird that uh, likes to scavenge for food is this. This is not a member of the crow family. This is a vulture. And it's called a turkey vulture, and it has become quite common in summer in British Columbia since the Second World War with the expansion of the highways. And it follows the highways and eats dead, anything dead along the highways. Ravens do not like turkey vultures because they compete for food. Now here's a, an idea of the size of the raven, wingtip to wingtip, one and a half meters, and the crow is just 0.75 meters. So you can see ravens are big. They have this wedge shaped, shaped tail, which is very distinctive, and they have a massive beak. They also have very deep guttural calls. And uh, we're going to have a look now at crows. These are our nice resident crows here on the coast, uh, northwestern crows. And they are very intelligent as well. I mean, stories about one that was riding the metro in Vancouver. Um, there are many stories about crows. They uh, harass birds of prey. And on the left, a couple of crows are chasing a barn owl, which doesn't even eat them. It's just, it happens that barn owls are owls and crows don't like owls. So this poor barn owl is getting harassed by them. Crows roost in enormous numbers up to many thousand, a couple of thousand in, in, in the evenings, in the fall, winter, and spring. And uh, there's several reasons that we think they do this. One of the main ones is to seek protection from these great horned owls. This is the largest owl we have in North America. And it likes to kill crows. It will eat them, but it has been recorded going into a crow roost and just killing crows and leaving them dead. So it's like it's doing it for fun. Uh, great horned owls, mind you, during the day, if they're found by crows, the crows will almost kill the great horned owl. So they are bitter enemies, these two birds. So we think this is one of the reasons the crows roost in uh, colonies, it gives them some protection against the great horned owl. And the barred owl, this is the one who goes, who coops for you, you can hear it at night quite often in the lower mainland here. It's a very common owl, but it's big, not as big as the great horn, but big enough to kill a crow. So uh, worth checking out. So there are the talents of the great horned owl. And on the right, we have a crow attacking a pussycat. 
poor cat up a tree being attacked by a crow. It looks as if it's about to fall out of the tree. Crows can be pretty aggressive. Now, the crow family has other members that are equally smart. And these are two of the uh, commonest. The one, the pair of birds on the right are Eastern blue jays. And they are found from the Maritimes in Canada, from the Atlantic, right across to the Rocky Mountains, to Alberta. And uh, at that point, they stop and a new species takes up. The place in the West, we have right down from Alaska down into Central America, in the mountains, we have the Stellar's Jay, bird, the bluebird on the left, named after a Danish explorer who worked for the Tsar of Russia back in the 1800s. So here we have on the right, a Stellar's Jay looking at a blue jay. And on the left, we have the map of where the two birds live. Uh, the dark, sort of gray green area is the Eastern and Central American home of the Stellars, of the Blue Jay. And the pink area on the left of the map of North America, running from Alaska, Alaskan coast, right down through the Rockies, into California and down the Rockies into Mexico and even into Central America is the home of the Stellar's Jay. Now they, they both are very intelligent. They learn uh, how to get food from us. And indeed you can see Stellar's Jays even in downtown in Vancouver. And uh, they're very good at uh, working out where we have food. And here we have a Stellar's Jay checking out a dining area. I don't think it's going to have the wine, but it's certainly going to have some sugar. It knows that these packets may contain something edible. So there it goes. I'm sure that will do a great deal of good. Give it a little energy, I guess. Stellar's Jays, like many birds, have subspecies. And uh, the uh, drawing on the right gives you an idea of how many subspecies there are of Stellar's jays. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine of them. And they go the whole way from northern, from the Sh Haida Gwaii, up in the north of uh, British Columbia on the coast, Haida Gwaii has its own subspecies. And that goes the whole way. We have a Stellar's jay going the whole way down into Central America. And these variations are just slight. And you can see uh, the uh, Haida Gwaii jay is the lower left one illustrated. And the uh, one above it is uh, central and southern Rockies. And you see, it's a lot lighter colored than the Haida Gwaii bird. Another jay that uh, we are beginning to see arriving in British Columbia on the coast here now because of climatic warming is the uh, scrub jay and it uh, lives in uh, Arizona, California, uh, Oregon, Washington state and it's starting to show up here in the lower mainland more and more regularly and it likes acorns. All crows like acorns. So jays especially like acorns. So here we have the uh, scrub jay having a nice feast of acorns. Another member of the jay family on the right is the Canadian gray jay, or whiskey jack. And the bird on the left is also called a whiskey jack sometimes, and it's a Clark's nutcracker, named after Mr. Clark. Nutcrackers usually eat pine seeds, uh, large pine seeds. They're usually about the size of your uh, small fingernail. But they will eat other things, just about anything else. They'll eat everything that a crow will eat, which is just about anything we will eat. And both these species, the Clark's Nutcracker and the Canada Gray Jay, like to take advantage of human beings. And here we have a Nutcracker eating something this lady is providing. 
And on the right, it's at the pine cones trying to get the pine seed. Uh, here it is uh, again. These are gray jays, Canada gray jays, and uh, they're, it's coming in to get food uh, from a uh, nice human being. Now, both birds are found very commonly around ski hills because there's lots of food from the skiers. Now, we, uh, we have just about come to the end of the crow family. These are a couple of guides that you might want to check out, the Crosley Guide to Raptors and the uh, Crosley Guide to, I think it's Eastern Birds, but there's one for Western Birds. We're gonna have a quick look at albino and lutistic birds. These are birds that normally uh, are fully colored as they're meant to be, but they turned out to be white. The bird on the left is an albino and it has a pink eye. You can see that? Pure white beak. And the bird on the right is lutistic. It doesn't have a pink eye. This is genetics at work here. The bird on the right is a robin and the bird on the left is a finch. Now here we have two more lutistic birds. The one on the left is an American robin. One on the right is, I believe, another American robin, and you can see this is quite a difference. They don't have to be totally white when they're autistic. Oh, the bird on the right is a very thrush. You see that by the wing pattern, pattern on the wings. So you can see that this uh, autistic or al and albino can occur just about any species of bird. Uh, for example, on the left is a male shoveler duck that is partly autistic. And on the right is a nice little dark eyed junco. Here is a hummingbird that is autistic. So, this is quite an amazing thing. It's genetics and uh, it's worth checking out on Google if you want to find out more about it. The um, it, it just any species on the left, a white raven that's lutistic. It's not an albino because it doesn't have the pink eye. And on the right is a barn owl that again is lutistic and it too doesn't have pink eyes. So that's how we know it's not an albino. On the left is a great horned owl that is autistic. And on the right is a barred owl that's autistic. So there you are. This is a uh, cartoon from the 1970s, uh, late 60s, early 70s. And as you can see, it's uh, a city. And there's an old fellow sitting there watching nature making a comeback. <laughs> and this one on the left is, uh, do you also eat these with the mask on? That is a anti-pesticide uh, cartoon. The man is spraying his vegetables. And on the right is a uh, gross world product. In other words, we have machines turning the world into gross world product. And we just recently, there was a disaster in the Sierra Nevada mountains down in California. 10,000 Californian sequoias, very ancient trees, 2,000 years old, were burned last year in a massive forest fire. This ad is, this, uh, <laughs> this cartoon is actually from the 1970s, 1968. And this is a, a dig at uh, developers soon to be erected on the site, Sequoia Square shopping center and 300 unit motel complex. Uh, <clears throat> it's rather funny that uh, Maplewood Conservation Area had, they had plans to put in a huge shopping center on that site and we managed to stop that. And now shopping centers are going bankrupt. 
because of Amazon. <laughs> uh, on the left, cartoon about the Middle East. And uh, here we have a, a US tank cooling up and saying, fill her up. And on the right, we have uh, what seems like a huge flood. A man and his son sitting on top of the car. And the son's asking his father, what's ecology, dad? So, and again, this is from the late 60s, early 70s by a cartoonist called R. Cobb. Kevin, I don't want to interrupt you. That's um, it. I was just going to say that we're, if we, we want to wrap up in the next minute or so, just because people might have questions. There we are. We're wrapped. That was oh, it. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. No, I didn't know. I just wasn't sure. Um, but yeah, so this might be a great time to ask some questions. Um, sure. Yeah. So I will just let everyone else know. Um, basically, if you want to ask a question, you can either type it in the chat. Um, and that's just down at the very bottom. Oh, I already see some coming through. That's awesome. Um, or you can unmute yourself. So you can unmute yourself and just ask it. Um, we're, you know, we're very casual here. So no worries about that. <laughs> um, yep. And yeah, so Kevin, I'll just ask you this first one that I see. Um, oh, first of all, someone did say, Scrub J is now Woodhouse J. So oh, also really? found in New Mexico. Yeah, so I just wanted to let you know that someone oh, did great. that. Oh, great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mary C. So um, Aaron Snell asked, uh, why do crows call three times? Ooh, that's a good question. I also have a question about calls later, so I'll, I'll ask that after. What was the question? I'm sorry. The question is, why do crows call, like, caw, Oh yeah. Three times, like ka ka ka, like that. <laughs> ah, well, I think that is an alarm call. Mm. Because funny today, um, I'm sitting in the garden, uh, having a little lunch, and uh, we have a pair of crows that's nesting not far away, and uh, a, a Cooper's hawk came by, and the crow started doing exactly that, ka ka ka. And it did it repeatedly, so it was not happy that the Cooper's hawk was there. <laughs> Cooper's hawks, the females are quite big, and they will actually eat crows. So, wow. yeah. But crows have a very, uh, what they've found, uh, crows actually make a very large vocabulary of noises. And uh, some of the noises are totally on crow like. Uh, they can almost do something like a purr, and they can also do sorts of little chuckles. Uh, and it's, you know, it's hard to uh, work out exactly what all of these noises mean, but it is becoming fairly apparent that they are communicating with each other through the noises they make. And uh, this is one of the reasons that they may also go to these huge winter roosts to find out where the food is. So, uh, I mean, uh, we have never been able to interview a crow. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to let people know because some people aren't from here or from Vancouver. So for anyone that's not from Vancouver, I don't know if this happens elsewhere. It probably does. Um, every day, basically, right around sunset, all the crows in the city, I would say at least 90% of them, they fly yeah. to one roost, which has changed spots over the years just because of different development. But uh, it's mainly in this area called Still Creek and Burnaby. So you can actually Google Still Creek Burnaby crows <laughs> or crow roost, um, oh, yeah. and it'll come up. And they all go there. And they've been roosting there since like before, like since time immemorial, basically, yeah. where um, well, it's been it. like that. They they don't yeah I mean they could have been roosting there since seventeen uh, hundreds or before you know we just mm -hmm. don't and uh, it is uh, it's funny the area that they've chosen is slightly milder in winter than the surrounding areas and it is fairly central for the this part of the lower mainland the greater yeah. Vancouver region it is pretty so, central yeah but one of the things they think that may be happening there is that they are communicating with each other and for example and this is pure make-believe in my head uh, a pair of crows fred and frida are sitting there and they're well fed and their neighbor looks at them and makes some sort of a noise and basically says where do you get your food 
because you're well fed. Yeah. I'm having a hard time. And they will presumably say, oh, we go to wherever. Yeah. And uh, this is one of the reasons, another reason we think these crows get together every night to exchange information. And wow. they can tell by looking at each other whether that other crow is well fed, not well fed, etc. Um, and I mean, one has to consider that in the middle of winter, December, days are very short. It's getting uh, dark around uh, 3 30, 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's getting daylight about what, 8 30 in the morning? Mm -hmm. And uh, these crows spend at least an hour flying to the roost yep. and flying out of the roost yep. every day. So they're yeah. at least two hours of valuable food gathering time to go and roost wow. together. That's so interesting. There's got to be some advantage to doing it. Yeah, this. exactly. It's so yeah. true. Um, kind of on that, someone did ask. Um, yeah, someone said 30 minutes before sunset, they will fly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's always usually the same path, which I always find so interesting. Like it goes right over my apartment and it's always really interesting to see. Um, yeah, it's always like a direct path. It's it's really quite interesting. Um, so someone did, there's a lot of questions. I will try to get through these because they're sure. great questions. And just to let everyone know, because we record this, um, you can go watch it later. So if you do have to leave, don't worry. Um, we record them, we upload them. They're on our Facebook and our YouTube channel, Wildbird Trust or Maplewood Flats, you'll find it. And um, yeah, so you can always go watch it later as well as all of Kevin's old um, Basics of Birding videos. So just to let everyone know that. So. Someone said, is it true that crows and ravens can recognize and identify human faces? I actually think this is true, but I'll let you go, Kevin. <laughs> oh, I think it's true. Yeah. 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 And I think it's, it's um, again, this is, I don't think it's, you know, ravens, crows, jays, magpies, which is a bird that's found in, in the Okanagan caribou. Uh, it's a crow, black and white, long tail. Uh, they all can recognize human beings. There are many stories of uh, uh, men who have been shooting crows or magpies or jays. And as soon as he goes out with his gun, they all get the hell out of the way. <laughs> there are also stories about people who go out to feed them and they know this person is coming to feed us. And they all come to see that person. Yeah. So, you know, they are very smart. They learn. Uh, all of them hide food at times of plentiful food supplies mm -hmm. or the times when there isn't food. And generally, yeah. of course, this goes back to when in the autumn or fall, they would have a lot of uh, nuts and uh, berries and stuff and they would hide those for the winter wow and this would be their food supply to get them through those really hard times in that's winter. amazing someone said so i mean here. one of the, the things is that birds like the jays and there are a number of species of jays around the world yeah. they uh, love acorns and they hide acorns in quite large caches and they can fly uphill with the acorns and you think of acorn it falls off an oak tree it rolls downhill but acorns once a crow or a jay has it it can take those acorns uphill and plant a new oak forest because yes the crows and jays remember where they put most of the acorns but they always forget some of them and those grow into new oak trees a uh, pinion jay, which is a, 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 a crow that lives in the United States in the Rocky Mountains, it eats pine nuts the size of the, uh, they're, they're edible pine nuts, the ones you buy in the store. And they carry those and store them also for the winter. So these birds are very intelligent. They are capable of learning and uh, as I was saying earlier, some of them have been taught to speak. They recognize rudimentary words. 
So for example, ravens have been taught and crows that uh, certain words mean certain things and they will remember that. So pretty smart. What fantastic words, I yeah. swear. Mm -hmm. uh, really quick, this isn't a question, but someone did say ravens stay all year near Lake Winnipeg in Manitoba, even though the lake freezes in the winter. So exactly what you're saying, they must be hiding food. And and I feel like sometimes when you are digging somewhere and then you find like an acorn, you're like, what is that doing there? And it must be like squirrels or you know ravens or crows, whatever yes, it is. might be. There's this really good question down here. I'm just gonna find it really quick. Um, crows eat a lot of human food and garbage, uh, sometimes synonymous, right? Um, has this affected their overall health in any way? Yeah, now uh, they have an amazing digestive system. Uh, in fact, they, they, I was reading the other day about vultures and they reckon vultures can almost digest bits of metal. <laughs> Hard to believe, uh, oh. but ravens uh, certainly must have an. All crows must have a very remarkable digestive system. So eating the food that we eat, uh, well, as we all know, uh, you know, if you certain foods are healthy foods for you. Uh, for example, blueberries, right? Yeah, very good for you. But certain other foods. Uh, Dairy Queen ice cream, maybe, <laughs> or uh, you know so, some of the fast foods, uh, chips, you know, like uh, potato chips. Uh, it depends, you know. A lot of the foods that we like to eat aren't really good for us, and likewise, they're probably not much good for crows and ravens. But it, they won't do them any harm. I mean, they're, they're pretty tough, and they'll wolf down just about anything. And yeah. uh, they have digestive systems that are quite happy to eat rotting carcasses full of maggots. Ooh. <laughs> okay. So I that, wouldn't say know, that's appetizing to me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, and that goes for ravens, crows, magpies, jays. They'll all wolf that down quite happily. Wow. Now, the thing that they eat that we provide for them are pesticides. Mm. Insecticides, herbicides, fungicides, all of those horrible chemical poisons. Yeah. Rhodicides, yeah. which kill rats. Yeah. And those, of course, are going to kill just about any of all of them. The thing is, when you when you use pesticides or rodenticides or whatever it might be, you are harming the small animals first, which it keeps expanding, right? Because the world is a food chain and it. it starts with the little animals and it can go all the way up. And that's why we see a lot of, um, we were talking about this in a previous um, talk about like the falcons and the, um, the eagles and, and hawks and all of those things that yeah. owls that eat these small creatures and unfortunately they get sick and it's, it is a big issue. Um, I do want to just be considerate of time though, Kevin. Yep. We have three more questions and we have about 15 minutes left. But sure. sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you about the. No, that that's I've finished. That's good. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. Um, someone said, I live in Texas um, and I never used to see ravens, and I'm seeing a few more each year. Not many, but more and more. Do you know if they're moving more and more south? And you were kind of mentioning how the other birds have been moving more north as well um, because of global warming and, and whatnot. And yeah. So, yeah, I would love to know that. That's a really good question. Well, now, what, what this sounds like to me, and, I, and this is purely a guess on my part, but ravens, uh, they had a hard time uh, with being shot and killed by, uh, by ranchers and farmers in the 1800s. Uh, basically, they were considered vermin because they, um, young calves and uh, young lambs, uh, especially, when they died on the, on the ranches, the ravens would come down and eat them. And uh, quite often the ranchers, the ranchers or farmers considered that the ravens actually killed the lambs or the calves. In fact, they They've done scientific studies, and the ravens don't do this, but they will eat the carcasses. So th th they were persecuted and shot 
and killed. And in fact, they were probably wiped out in many areas. Uh, I know that they've done extensive studies in the British Isles and ravens up until the uh, late 1600s were common in the city of London. Uh, and uh, after that, they were eradicated and they were eradicated from most of England. And by the 1940s and 50s, they were only found in Wales, the very west of the British Isles and in Scotland. And in the last, since the Second World War, they have moved back into England and into uh, London. They're now turning up there. So once the uh, persecution stops, the birds will move back into the areas where they were eradicated by being shot and killed. So you may have a situation in your part of Texas where that is happening. Uh, it's quite, it's probably what's happening. Mm -hmm. I don't know for sure because I'm not familiar with Texas to that yeah. degree. But Th That makes a lot yeah. of sense though, honestly. I mean, that's kind of similar. I think we were talking about the Purple Martins, right? And yeah. how they were decimated for so long and now just you know, because of thanks to you and many others um, all around, oh. now they're starting to come back. And I think that's, that's right. We put up nest boxes all along the West Coast, uh, California, Oregon, Washington, and in BC here, yeah. all around the Salish Sea. And the uh, Purple Martins have made a dramatic recovery because of wow. nest boxes. That's so wow. good. That's amazing. Someone said a Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. We are seeing a handful of ravens here over the winter months. That's really cool. I mean, definitely yep. maybe, yeah, like the same as that, or maybe even just like warmer weather, but that's really cool. It's so interesting. Well, I've just had a horrible thought about Mexico. <sighs> I'm not going to share it. Okay, no worries. No, no. Um, Someone said, we have a tons and tons of purple martins in Texas. That's so cool. Yeah, yeah. They fly all the way south, right? Yes. Purple martins head right through Texas. They're heading, uh, it's one of their flyways. They head from the east. Most of the purple martins in North America live in eastern North America. So the western ones join them, and they head right down through Central America. And they actually winter in the Amazon rainforest. Wow. And That's apparently they found the actual place where the purple martins, uh, one of the, one big roost, and it's in an oil refinery in the Amazon rainforest. Wow. That's and they wild. think that that's because there are no predators in the oil refinery. Mm -hmm. That makes night. sense. Um, someone yeah. asked, and we'll just do maybe one or two more questions. So yeah. if you have any, definitely type them in the chat or you can unmute yourself. Um, Someone, so Lisa said, where do ravens and crows nest? I think that's a really good question. In trees or oh, bushes? Right. Or... Yeah, um, well, ravens like to nest, they like nesting on cliffs. So uh, sea cliffs by the ocean, mountains, cliffs, but they will also build nests in trees. And they're pretty big, sticky type nests. So they do that. And in fact, I think they've now been recorded nesting on the side of buildings in cities because a high rise or a skyscraper is a cliff face and uh, ravens will make use of that. Wow. I, so uh, they're pretty good at uh, finding places to nest. Uh, crows generally build nests of sticks in trees. Mm. Uh, certainly our Northwestern crow, our American crows do that. In Europe, Eurasia, they have a crow called the rook, R-O-O-K, and rooks actually build their nests in colonies in trees. And that's called a rookery. <laughs> and it's very noisy, especially in March when they're starting to nest. And uh, actually, uh, a bit macabre, uh, rookeries are generally in a lot of these trees are in graveyards. So the rookery will be in a graveyard. Oh my God. And of course, you have all these black birds flying around over the graveyard. Wow. So that can be a little bit uh, spooky, I suppose, for some people. Wow, that's amazing. That's so interesting. 
crows actually uh, uh, have a lot of mythology around them. Uh, there's a rhyme about magpies, one for sorrow, two for joy, three for a girl, four for a boy. And it goes on and on. You could Google it, but it's, uh, it's, it's a long one. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, we, we had a post on our Instagram about crows a few months ago, and I learned so much from it. It was, you know, just how these, in different regions across the world, there's all these different, you know, yeah, like um, different stories about them, and some are good and some are bad, and oh, yeah. some talk yeah. about wisdom, and some talk about, you know, uh, you know bad omens, and mm -hmm. it's so interesting. Um, Dene Moore asks, what is something that we can do to be bird friendly? At the very least, put a, a bird bath or or anything else. Someone else, I think, asked at the top here. Give me one second. Um, oh, I can't remember what where it was, but it was something about um, being bird safe or something like that. So I'll find that. But if you could ask that, answer that first question, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, I think one of the first things is. Small birds, which are the ones that need our help probably most, the small songbirds, they like uh, a nice thick uh, thicket of shrubs. Uh, the thicker and more untidy it is, and the more species of shrubs that are in there, the better, uh, especially shrubs that have berries uh, and, of course, flowers, and they all have flowers. So a good thicket of shrubs that's uh, impenetrable is really great for small songbirds because it's a place to take to hide. It's a place to find insects to eat, to find seeds and to find berries to eat. It's also a place to roost in uh, at all times of the year, but especially in the winter, especially if the shrubs are uh, uh, coniferous evergreen shrubs like yew or juniper. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is putting up nest boxes for those small birds that like nest boxes like chickadees, nuthatches, swallows. Barn swallows need a lot of help at the moment. They're suffering terribly from the loss of insects and uh, certainly uh, there, there are special nest boxes you can build for barn swallows, uh, tree swallows, violet green swallows. Yeah, they can all use nest boxes. Uh, the last thing that I was thinking of, and I, I've lost, oh, feeding birds in the winter. Uh, in our northern, where we live, on the west coast of Canada, uh, winter is generally November, December, January, February. And that's when birds do need a bit of help from food, seed, uh, millet and black oil, sunflower seeds, and a bit of fat. Uh, this is a good time to feed them. But unfortunately, where we live, you have to watch out for the black bears. So if you live in the North Shore of Vancouver, maybe you got to make sure there are no black bears around. If you live in Kitsilano, Vancouver, or Delta, or uh, Burnaby, downtown. Maybe. Downtown, yeah, you can you can feed the birds all through the winter because there ain't no black bears down there. Hopefully, <laughs> that is very true. So, uh, yes. Yeah, that's uh, there you go. Uh, that's a good. Uh, and someone else had asked that the question I was looking for was, "What's your opinion on feeding crows?" Um, and so I think that's a that's a good thing. Is that yes, you know, we can provide appropriate food for these well, animals crows, appropriate times of the year. Crows are getting fed by us, whether we like it or not. Um, True. Crows have done exception. We have made crow have heaven. Uh, the, the crows that lived here before the arrival of the Europeans, let's say pre-1800, they, they had a tough time. They lived along the shoreline, and they lived around the uh, villages and towns of the native people. But they had a tough time in the winter getting enough food. Crows were, they don't, and they didn't, they don't, and they didn't like thick, old growth coniferous forest. Crows found that inhospitable and they wouldn't go in there. So uh, they stuck to the shoreline or to the 
open grassy areas, shrubby areas. Well, what did we do? We cut down all the old growth forests and we made fields and we made hedgerows and the crows loved it. The other thing we did was we collected all our garbage and put it in a great big pile called a garbage dump. And the crows loved that too. So even to this day, the big landfill at Burns Bog, south of Vancouver, is a huge garbage dump. And it has a lot of crows, ravens, yep. glaucous wing gulls, yep. bald eagles, rats, mice, and other small bird species that are all eating our garbage. Yeah, so true. So until we find a better way of getting rid of our garbage, we're going to have lots of crows. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And I so, think I, mean, I think somebody feeding a crow a few crusts of bread is, yeah. It's, it's, I mean, if it gives, you know, it's very hard to tell somebody whose life is. Uh, who gets pleasure out of doing that? Yeah, you and know? you know it's. it's you got to stop. You know it's like. Yeah. Well, maybe uh, those crow. I mean, those crows are giving a certain amount of pleasure to somebody. Yeah. Maybe a highlight of their day. You know. Yeah, exactly. Like I said, you know, and it depends. Like I think someone in the chat said that in in Winnipeg they need to because it's or in Manitoba, sorry, because it's so cold there, right? They need oh. to feed the birds. And the exactly, like wherever you're from, whatever's appropriate for your region, you know, follow those guidelines, right? When you were here on the right. West Coast, it's a bit harder because, you know, in nature, if we start feeding a lot of those birds, it's not so good, right? But yeah. you know, something like a crow that's already in the city rummaging through trash. You know, if you are eating a piece of pizza and you kind of throw a little piece off, I don't see as that as being the worst thing in the world. Although that's just my opinion, so you know, take that as yeah. it is. Well, I mean, the other the other side of the coin is the trash is there. Yeah. And if the crows don't get it, the rats will. Yes. <laughs> we are going a little off topic here. Yeah, so but I anyway, there you are. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Kevin and I are we love talking, so we could go on forever. Um, yeah. Yeah. But um, I will say to everyone, it is 8 p.m. So I think we'll end there. That was a pretty good question. Oh, yeah. I did have one last question and one last one. How many, do you know how many like roughly types of crows there would be? Like, is it in the hundreds? You know how you're talking about like the variations of crows or? Oh, uh, well, not the species are known, you know, Sorry. that's, and uh, give me a sec. Uh, all I can do is, uh, Give you an idea in north, you know, in, in Western North America. Mm -hmm. But we have actually uh, right here in beautiful Western North America one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, fourteen species of crows <laughs> in the western half of North America. But wow. uh, worldwide, I have no yeah. idea. And so probably I mean, hundreds. When you're going into the numbers, like the population of a species, mm -hmm. uh, that's guesswork. And yeah. I mean, some of it can be fairly accurate, yeah. uh, especially, especially if it's dealing with some sort of rarer species. Uh, for example, Hawaii has a crow called the Hawaiian crow. And I think they know to the exact number just about how many Hawaiian crows wow. are. Wow, that's amazing. But, uh, it's, you know, so yeah, but when it comes to something like our native crow here, yeah, no, of I have course no not. <laughs> no, no thank you for that, Kevin. I really appreciate okay. that. Um, I will let everyone go. It is very hot in my apartment, so I'm gonna yeah. go get a nice glass of cold water. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their evening. Thank you, everyone, for your questions, uh, for your listening, and for joining us today. We just love it, and thank you to Kevin. I love when you're sharing all your knowledge and your wisdom and thank you for yep. such a great conversation so um uh yeah so i will let everyone go there um yeah there's um one of these events every week uh, every month so yep. tune into the next one it's usually the first saturday or sometimes the first thursday um, i think we're on the thursdays now 
Yes, exactly. So yep. first Thursday uh, of every month and we love it. And I will be uploading this video to YouTube if you all want to go back to that uh, and watch it later on. So again, thank ne you. So next much. time we're gonna just give you a hint. Next time we're going to look at some of the unusual uh, aspects of uh, bird behavior and uh, threats to birds. Nice. Okay. And how okay, we can that's help perfect. Them. That's good to know. Okay. Thank you. And Kevin, if you just want to stay on for two seconds, okay? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.